Good evening. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Rush, and I teach here at Brown University in the nonfiction writing program. I'm here to welcome you to the kickoff event of the 2019 Nonfiction at Brown Reader Series, Lecture Series. And we have a super exciting lineup this year. We have a lot of local Providence authors, including tonight's guest, Dan Denver. We also have Nora Khan and Amy Pickworth coming later in the semester. And on October 18th, we have Francisco Cantu, who'll be joining us from Tucson, Arizona. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have a long list of organizations that we have to thank um, for making tonight possible, including the Marshall Wood Lectureship Foundation for the Fine Arts, the Swearer Center, the Department for Hispanic Studies and the English Department here at Brown, the Center for the Study of Race and, Race and Ethnicity in America, the Zucker Family Endowment, the Brown Arts Initiative, and the Kogut Institute for the Humanities. Thank you to all of those different institutes at Brown for supporting the lecture series. Um, full disclosure, I have known tonight's speaker, Dan Denver, for over 15 years, which is a little bit frightening to say. Uh, I first encountered Dan back when he served as the student body president at Reed College, a small liberal arts school where we both did our undergraduate work. Um, and Dan recently reminded me that one of his um, moments of glory as student body president was shutting down traffic in downtown Portland, Oregon in protest of the Iraq war. Is that correct? True story. True story. With other people. With other people, <laughs> not single-handedly. Got a lot of people out there to do that. Um, I mentioned these things because for as long as I've known Dan, he's been deeply involved in the communities of which he is a member contributing time, energy, resources, and willpower, always working towards a functioning and just democracy. So when in 2012, Dan's work at the Philadelphia City Paper was honored by the city's monthly magazine as some of the most important done in the previous year, I wasn't surprised to read the jury's comments. I thought I'd share some of them with you tonight. They wrote, Dan Denver earned his reputation as a self-righteous pain in the ass an unabashed class warrior, and the Philadelphia journalist most likely to start a public argument with other journalists over their failure to meet the standards of repertorial decorum. <laughs> but the same qualities that earned Denver a parody Twitter account also drove him to relentlessly explore who wields power in this city and how the poor often get screwed by the powerful. Since his stint at Philadelphia City Paper, Dan's worked for Salon, City Lab, The Appeal, and his work regularly appears in the New York Times, The Washington Post, The Nation, and Vox. He's the host of Jacobin Magazine's The Dig podcast, which has earned him great fame amongst lefty intellectuals. And he's also visiting fellow in international and public affairs at Brown University's The Watson Institute. Tonight, he'll speak with all of us about his forthcoming book from Verso Press, all-American nativism, how the bipartisan war on immigrants explains politics as we know it. And we'll follow his question with, a sh with his talk with a short Q&A, so have those questions ready. Please join me in welcoming Dan Denver. Thanks uh, very much for having me. This is the most extensively I've talked about my book, which is supposedly going to be out in January. So I also welcome comments on like the form of this because I've decided to sort of like summarize the whole thing, which could be a good decision, it could be a bad one. You'll be the first to find out. <laughs> this is also the first PowerPoint presentation I think I've made maybe ever, I don't know. And it's not even PowerPoint, it's whatever the free one that comes with Mac is, I couldn't, yeah. Um, when Trump was elected, a standard liberal response to his politics in general and to his nativism in particular, was that this is not normal. And there is indeed a lot about Trump that is frighteningly new. But what history reveals is that he was drawing and has been drawing on a deep well of all American nativism that is all too normal, an all too normal history that makes Trump legible, incredible, to far too many people. In the next 40 minutes, I'm going to give you the short version of what I do at some length in my book, which is to make an argument 
as to how a half century long war on immigrants, sorry, how, <laughs> how a half century long war on immigrants has warped American politics and made the moment we live in today. What's more, I believe we have a historic opportunity right now to end the bipartisan war on immigrants and build a left pro-immigrant governing coalition rooted in the power of a diverse multiracial working class. But first I need to provide some key context and that requires stepping back, way back into the past few hundred years of history of this place that became the United States. Because to understand how anti-immigrant politics became the center of American politics today, we must first look at how European settlers became natives and how they then became nativists. A racist population politics geared toward profit and the control of land was at the center of the settler colonial project in North America and it was built upon various forms of unfree labor. Let me see if I can figure out how to use this. Aha. These statistics show what American migration politics and policy looked like at the beginning. Those who did menial and degraded labor over the centuries, enslaved Africans, Mexicans, Chinese, were from the mid 17th century on consistently racialized. The racial identity imposed on these workers, in turn, became defined by the work that they did. It was not some objective reality of race. The American Revolution was then waged for many reasons, but the existence of settler colonialism in North America was not itself at issue. Those of us in this room who are white Americans tend not to think of ourselves as strangers to this land in the way that we would of a French person in Algeria or an English or Dutch descendant person in South Africa. Compared to those contexts here, settler colonialism achieved such a massive transformation that it became normal. And that normalization of settlement was a precondition for anti-immigrant politics. What was at issue in the revolution then was not settler colonialism, but rather American colonists right to direct its march across the continent. It was quite straight, straightforwardly a settler revolt. The settlers wanted to rule and they wanted to expand. And they did. The post-revolutionary project of westward expansion was carefully, explicitly, and officially calibrated to ensure European descendant settler majorities in territories taken from indigenous people purchased from France and conquered from Mexico. Oops. All right. The flip side of this expansionary project was harsh restrictions on the movement of non-white people. That included the genocidal elimination, relocation and confinement of indigenous people and the subjugation and control of enslaved Africans. And we continue to see it today in the form of mass incarceration and residential segregation. Immigration restriction and control is part of a larger racist population control politics that operates internally, at the border, and also abroad. In their aspiration to ensure white majorities and white dominance, multiple racialized groups were targeted for control and outright exclusion. Chinese workers were banned beginning in 1882, amid the rise of industrial capitalism, and Asians from most everywhere would ultimately be banned from entry. When in the late 19th and early 20th century, the US embarked on a project of transoceanic imperialism, some of the fiercest critics were nativists who, who opposed imperialism on the grounds that it would bring non-white people into the polity. This was the case with the war against Mexico. While some racists argued for seizing the entirety of Mexico, other racists argued that the US should only seize those portions where white demographic dominance, white demographic dominance could be assured. 
Still, an estimated 60,000 Mexicans became American by treaty in 1848. And the development of American capitalism, especially in that territory taken from Mexico, would demand millions of Mexican workers during the southwestern agricultural boom in the early 20th century, and later with the rise of places like Phoenix as desert boom towns. A major component of this was something called the Bracero Program, a massive guest worker system that issued Mexican workers 4.6 million temporary visas between 1942 and 1964. And so Mexicans were recruited in large numbers at the same time that Asian exclusion expanded to informally include Japan in 1907, and then most of the rest of Asia in 1917 as what was called the Asiatic Bard Zone. Mexican migration was also protected from the next big push for restriction, which targeted Southern and Eastern Europeans, including Jews and Italians, which was propelled at the time in the early 20th century by both the widespread popularity of eugenics and by progressive era social science. In the 1920s, a series of laws extended Asian exclusion to formally cover Japan and established the National Origins Quota System, which sought to freeze the country's demography in place by distributing visas according to the national origins of people already in the country. For the duration of the quota's four-decade lifespan, immigrants from Great Britain, Germany, and Ireland made up nearly three-quarters of the total. And with migrants from huge swaths of Europe and Asians banned, Mexican labor was demanded to fill the gap, including and especially through the Bracero program. This all changed in 1965 when the quotas were repealed. In part, that happened because the restrictions were a Cold War liability. The US was fighting the Soviet Union for the affections of the decolonizing world. And for obvious reasons, it was insulting to bar a country's nationals from entry because of racist immigration law. And so on the one hand, this was a huge victory. It was the end of explicitly racist immigration law in the United States in 1965. But it also, at the same time, accelerated the criminalization of Mexican migration. In 1964, the Bracero program was terminated. The 1965 law that ended the quota system also imposed a first ever cap on total Western Hemisphere migration. And then, most consequentially, in 1976, a law was passed that gave every country in the world the same 20,000 visa slots. And so pre-existing Mexican migration continued, but rather suddenly it was criminalized. It was at the same time that white ethnics were formally incorporated, fully incorporated, as members of the American family. And thus, when this idea that we live in a nation of immigrants became a dominant myth, this myth was superficially inclusive, but it also invisibilized the country's history of racist population politics. And it set up Mexican immigration to be declared a problem of illegality of people who, unlike other immigrants, those who came through Ellis Island, didn't come, quote, the right way. This was also the moment that the contemporary nativist movement that we know today took root. It first emerged as an outgrowth of environmentalist concerns over overpopulation. And these concerns reflected this broader malaise that marked the 1970s, a period when the great society's promise of limitless possibility crashed amid the Vietnam War, the economic crisis, and the oil shock, and then saw the neoliberal restructuring of the economy, which caused deindustrialization and crushed a decade of union militancy. A network of organizations founded by a populationist named John Tanton, you may have heard his name recently because he died and there were a lot of obituaries about this horrible man. <laughs> um, he, he had worked with both the Sierra Club and Planned Parenthood, 
founded this network of organizations that would become immensely powerful. This network, funded by Mellon heir Cordelia Scaife May, included the Federation for American Immigration Reform, U.S. English, the Center for Immigration Studies, and Numbers USA. That's from a recent New York Times investigation on Cordelia Scaife May that was pretty solid. In the 1980s, these nativist organizations mobilized on two fronts. Before immigration had really taken shape as an issue that we would as we would recognize it today. One was for official English laws, and two was pushing for a law to sanction employers who employed undocumented immigrants. The first, the campaign to make English the official language, was particularly strategic for this moment before nativism became a mass issue in this country because it resonated with those who subscribed to the assimilationist ideology of the nation of immigrants mythology, and also, at the same time, those holding already more openly racist anti-immigrant views. It could speak to both audiences. The English-only campaign won a huge number of big, if mostly symbolic, victories, including a referendum in San Francisco and another in California. The second campaign, the attempt to secure employer sanctions, was, was more complex and had complex outcomes. In, in 1986, President Reagan and a bipartisan group in Congress made the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, law. It's now remembered as last and really the only major legalization law, which gave legal status to millions of undocumented immigrants. But it also contained employer sanctions. And so this law that today is remembered as this huge victory for immigrant rights at the time was actually supported by nativists because of the employer sanctions and opposed by immigrant rights groups for the same reason. Those employer sanctions, however, were never effective at driving undocumented workers from the labor market. As a result, nativists would come to fiercely oppose any legislation to legalize undocumented immigrants, which they would come to call amnesty. By the 1990s, the nativist movement found that while there was widespread anti-immigrant sentiment pretty much anywhere in the, across the political spectrum, in amongst Latinos, amongst black Americans, there were pocket, strong pockets of it everywhere. The only place where there was a red hot base of support for nativism, unsurprisingly, was on the right. And it found that out in a big way in California in 1994, when amid a recession, nativists skillfully used Proposition 187, a ballot referendum that would deny undocumented, undocumented immigrants public services, including access to public schools. They took advantage of that and put the issue, to put the issue at the center of public debate. The Republican governor, Pete Wilson, hitched himself to Prop 187 and wrote it to a re-election re victory. In the 80s, Wilson had been a senator and he had been a big ally of agricultural growers in California and had stridently opposed employer sanctions. But he wisely, if uh, horribly, discerned that nativism was good conservative culture war politics. Here's a Wilson ad that captures that approach. They keep coming. Two million illegal immigrants in California. The federal government won't stop them at the border, yet requires us to pay billions to take care of them. Governor Pete Wilson sent the National Guard to help the border patrol, but that's not all. For Californians who work hard, pay taxes, and obey the laws, I'm suing to force the federal government to control the border. And I'm working to deny state services to illegal immigrants. Enough is enough. Governor Pete Wilson. But it wasn't just conservatives. Leading centrist liberals leveraged the border crisis that politics had made to their own ends, too. California Senator Dianne Feinstein, still California's senator, did so before Governor Wilson, saying that her so-called moderate approach of supporting increased border security was necessary, quote, to avoid a serious backlash against all immigrants. Meanwhile, President Bill Clinton's administration 
used the political crisis to campaign for NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, arguing that only free trade would create the economic development that would stop Mexicans from migrating north. But the Clinton administration also unleashed a newly intensified militarization of the border, first in El Paso with Operation Hold the Line, and then later that year in 1994 in San Diego with Operation Gatekeeper on the eve of the vote on Prop 187. This was a border patrol, a new border patrol strategy called prevention through deterrence, which involved flooding the border with agents at major unauthorized crossing points. The crackdown served unstated political goals as well. As Clinton's senior advisor, Rahm Emanuel, who you unfortunately will still see on TV today, um, as he put it in a 1996 memo, the war on illegal immigration and the war on drugs were meant to protect NAFTA from public dissent. Emmanuel wrote, quote, we should be honest that if we want continued public support for trade and friendly relations with Mexico, we must be vigilant in our effort to curb illegal trade, e.g. narcotics and immigrants. Initially, the crackdown seemed to work. Crossings in El Paso and San Diego plummeted. But in reality, the strategy only worked as public relations. Undocumented Mexican migration routes simply shifted to places like Arizona, where as a result, a huge number of migrants would die in dangerous desert, in dangerous desert conditions. Clinton also signed two major pieces of anti-immigrant legislation that linked the traditionally more civil immigration enforcement system to the criminal justice system the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, or IRA-IRA, and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, or EDPA. Another law, welfare reform, not only gutted support for low-income women as a consequence of years of the racist pathologization of black mothers, but also cut benefits for, for legal immigrants. In short, Republicans did their best to turn anti-immigrant politics to their partisan advantage. Clinton did the same. He triangulated, pushing a slightly more moderate politics that managed to both placate anti-immigrant sentiment while making Republicans look extreme by comparison. In the 1996 presidential election, Bob Dole and Bill Clinton battled over who was the toughest on illegal immigrants. This is the dull ad. This is a dull ad that gives you a sense. Two million illegal aliens in California. Twenty thousand in our prisons. Four hundred thousand crowd our schools. Every year they cost us three billion tax dollars. Bill Clinton has fought California in court, forcing us to support them. Clinton fought Prop 187, cut border agents, gave citizenship to aliens with criminal records. We pay the taxes. We are the victims. Our children get shortchanged. If Clinton wins, we lose. OK, well, that's disgusting. But here's, uh, here's Clinton's uh, bold, principled retort. So desperate and wrong. President Clinton doubled border agents, a thousand more for California, signed a tough anti-illegal immigration law protecting US workers, 160,000 illegal immigrants and criminals deported, a record. Bob Dole voted against reimbursing California for jailing illegal immigrants. Time magazine says his risky tax scheme could cut 2,000 border agents, cut 4,000 FBI. Bob Dole, wrong in the past, wrong for our future. All right. These ads might seem shocking, given that for many today, though by no means most, or not by no means all, sorry, Trump's rhetoric seems so new. That's what you hear in kind of from the liberal commentary all the time. This is not normal. But the war on immigrants, or at least the war on illegal immigrants, was a thoroughly bipartisan one. From 1996 on, this bipartisan war would be a cruel form of political theater that demonized undocumented immigrants and spectacularly militarized the border 
while conveniently keeping the deep cuts to legal immigration sought by nativists off the table. By the end of the decade, Clinton's triangulation had seemingly worked, and anti-immigrant politics weren't a law. They weren't discussed at all in the 2000 presidential debates, not once. Immigration did not come up in any of the three debates. Before the September 11th attacks, President George W. Bush was seriously considering a legalization program, focused on guest workers, of course, and was in high profile negotiations with Mexican President Vicente Fox. The war on terror, however, stopped those negotiations and they injected the potential threat posed by Muslim outsiders into the debate. But for Bush, open Islamophobia at home posed a threat to the war on Muslim majority countries abroad because it would undermine America's supposedly noble calling to promote democracy through military interventions. Bush visited a mosque shortly after the attack and gave this speech. Like the good folks standing with me, the American people uh, were appalled and outraged. Um, at last Tuesday's attacks, and so were Muslims all across the world. Both Americans, our Muslim friends and citizens, taxpaying citizens, and uh, Muslims and nations uh, were just appalled and could not believe uh, what, what we saw on our TV screens. These acts of violence against innocents violate the fundamental tenets of the Islamic faith. And it's important for my fellow Americans to understand that. The English translation is not as eloquent as the original Arabic, but let me quote from the Quran itself. In the long run, evil in the extreme will be the end of those who do evil. For that they rejected the signs of Allah and held them up to ridicule. The face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. These terrorists don't represent peace. They represent evil and war. Republican favorable attitudes towards Muslims remarkably skyrocketed in the wake of the September 11th attacks. This data is from Pew. Conservative Republican favorability towards Muslims rose from 35% in March 2001 to 64% in October 2001. Unfavorability plummeted to 19%. Think about that. A, a Republican base that would 15 years later catapult Trump into office had a surge in affection towards Muslims right after 9-11. Today, as a result, Bush is often contrasted against Trump. Bush was decent. Trump, by contrast, is an unbridled racist who represents a break with Republican tradition. But this is an incredible distortion. In fact, Bush's policies, particularly the war on terror, laid the foundation for Trump. Republican favorability towards Muslims rose because Bush's war on terror channeled grassroots popular Islamophobia into the government's official war, which was portrayed in the neocons framing, not as a war on Islam, but rather as a way to liberate Muslims from despots and terrorists. Later, the war on terror would delegitimate itself, and the result would be massive and virulent Islamophobia on the US right. But not yet. I will get to that moment later. Meanwhile, in regards to immigration policy, the war on terror created a national security state that intensified the militarization of the border and led to the mass detention and deportation of Muslims, many of whom were subjected to harsh abuse. 
It also led to a renewed surge in border security spending and made border security first and foremost an issue of national security. In 2004, the Border Patrol released a new national border patrol strategy explicitly equating immigration enforcement with counterterrorism. This excerpt is from Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Robert C. Bonner, who summarizes the, the mindset nicely. The priority mission of CBP, specifically including all Border Patrol agents, is homeland security, nothing less than preventing terrorists and terrorist weapons, including potential weapons of mass destruction, from entering the United States. The Border Patrol's traditional missions of interdicting illegal aliens and drugs and those who attempt to smuggle them across our borders remain important. Indeed, these missions are complementary. We cannot reduce or eliminate illegal entry by potential terrorists without also dramatically reducing illegal migration across our borders. Both the priority and the traditional missions are served by this bold national strategy. I wanna pause and dissect this for a moment. The war on drugs and undocumented immigrants at the border would continue, is what he's saying. In fact, those wars would intensify because every undocumented immigrant or drug smuggler was also a potential terrorist. Still, amid it all, in terms of legislative policy, what Bush and leaders from both major parties continued to push for was something kind of like IRCA in 1996, comprehensive immigration reform, a euphemism for the combination of more immigration enforcement, more border militarization, and more guest worker programs with the provision of legal status and a pathway to citizenship to millions of undocumented immigrants in the country. But quickly it became clear that any attempt to legalize unauthorized, undocumented immigrants was immediately met with a ferocious pushback from the right, stoked by groups like Numbers USA, a core node in the network of nativist organizations created by John Tanton, the founder of the contemporary nativist movement who I mentioned earlier. From the get-go, Bush's strategy was to win the Republican right over through more enforcement, especially at, at both the border and in the interior. On March 29th, 2005, the Bush administration, for example, announced that it would send 500 additional border patrol agents to Arizona. This was just three days before a new vigilante movement, the far right Minutemen Project, was set to begin a massive, board, a massive citizens patrol of that state's border with Mexico. Here are some uh, elderly vigilantes vicariously enjoying the post 9-11 national security state. Um, I think this photo more than any I've ever seen in my life encapsulates the American far right, but this is another story. Um, Bush wanted to convince the American public in general and the right in particular that the border was under control in order to win them over to supporting so-called comprehensive immigration reform. But all that it actually did was to convey that the border was indeed in a crisis, that it was insecure. Why otherwise were so many more agents required? Bush's militarization attempt to outflank the Minutemen. Instead, he affirmed, he helped affirm for many conservatives that the Minutemen were right. In 2006, while Bush and congressional moderates were pushing for comprehensive, a comprehensive reform bill, the House passed the Sensenbrenner bill instead. It was a draconian enforcement only measure that would have criminalized mere undocumented presence in the country. The bill was so draconian that it met with opposition from politicians in both parties who otherwise were totally fine with advocating strongly for a war on undocumented immigrants, but this was a bridge too far. It was the origins of the polarized realignment around immigration that we see today. 
On the one hand, the bill signaled that a nativist right ascendant within the Republican Party would not be satisfied with mainstream anti-immigrant politics, let alone with a comprehensive immigration reform bill that included legalization, which they demonized as amnesty. But on the other hand, in response to the bill, a mass grassroots movement emerged, marking the beginning of the contemporary immigrant rights movement that we know today. These are photos from uh, the May, May Day 2006 protests in LA, where an estimated half million people took to the streets. There were huge demonstrations everywhere. I think LA were probably the largest. The establishment attempted to channel this grassroots energy into their campaign for comprehensive immigration reform. But this again was a doomed strategy because it failed to comprehend what was happening on the Republican right. Hardcore nativists would oppose anything that they considered amnesty, no matter how much repressive enforcement was included to sweeten the deal for them. Meanwhile, the establishment's actions stoked the nativist sentiment, the very nativist sentiment it was supposed to placate. Figures in both major parties in 2006 voted for a standalone enforcement measure in the run-up to midterm elections called the Secure Fence Act, which called for 700 miles of fencing to be built along the border with Mexico. Today, the 650 miles of fencing that exists is a border wall that Trump had nothing to do with building. And you can see the increase in spending and in fence, fencing, or you call it a wall, along the border. While many liberal Democrats and some powerful Democrats, even like Harry Reid, did vote no on it, many others joined a nearly united Republican bloc in voting yes, including Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden. New funding also accelerated the explosive growth of the Border Patrol, which went from 4,100 agents in 1992 to more than 20,000 by the time Obama took office. In an attempt to outflank the right, President Bush also took executive actions to deputize local law enforcement in jail to enforce immigration law. He also launched a series of workplace raids, including the massive May 12, 2008 ICE raid of agro-processors, a kosher meat packing, packing plant in Pottsville, Iowa, Postville, Iowa. Two, 389 workers were detained. It was one of the largest workplace raids ever. Hundreds were sentenced in makeshift courtrooms set up at nearby Waterloo's National Cattle Congress in what the ACLU called a guilty plea machine. 297 served five-month month prison sentences before deportation. Deportations climbed, and the nativist right was further emboldened. This can be seen in another form of nativism that was gaining ground, Islamophobia. The polling clearly shows that the trend was connected to what became increasingly seen as a quagmire in the Middle East. Republican hostility toward Islam increases as the war on terror expands, fails to secure its stated aims, and thus delegitimizes itself, most spectacularly with the rise of ISIS, itself a consequence of the invasion of Iraq. The trend also parallels the campaign and presidency of Obama, an avatar of otherness for a Republican right, who in significant numbers believed he was a secret Muslim. Obama, in turn, accelerated Bush's policy of orchestrating a deportation crackdown to push the case for bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform and to win over the nativist right to that agenda. His administration relied on deporting recent border crossers and on adopting a program called Secure Communities, which connected ICE to local law enforcement all over the country. This sparked the next phase in the mass immigrant rights movement that began in 2006. Militant activists, especially Latinx youth, 
mounted a campaign calling for an end to Obama's deportations. The Obama administration found itself in an incredibly awkward place where it was mounting a legal fight against Arizona's notorious SB 1070 law, which made local police into immigration enforcers while implementing a policy at the federal level that was remarkably similar. Even then, establishment immigrant rights groups sought to protect Obama and his legislative agenda. But the radical movement ultimately won major victories, winning Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, and then Deferred Action for the Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, or DAPA, which was ultimately blocked in court. They also won a significant decrease in deportations overall in the final years of Obama's administration. But Obama's insistence that immigration enforcement was a matter of deporting criminal aliens helped to provide Trump with his language and make that language legible to people. This is the sort of language backed up by policy that I'm talking about. I took those actions this week. We're providing more resources at the border to help law enforcement personnel stop illegal crossings and send home those who do cross over. We'll focus enforcement resources on people who are threats to our security. Felons, not families. Criminals, not children. And we'll bring more undocumented immigrants out of the shadows so they can play by the rules, pay their fair share of taxes, pass a criminal background check, and get right with the law. Nothing about this action will benefit anyone who has come to this country recently or who might try and come to America illegally in the future. It does not grant citizenship or the right to stay here permanently or offer the same benefits that citizens receive. This is Obama defending curb protections, new protections for people against deportation, thanks to massive pressure from the grassroots immigrant rights movement after achieving record deportations. Two of Obama's core immigration enforcement programs, Secure Communities and 287G, which deputized local law enforcement to enforce immigration law, were justified on the grounds that they targeted criminal aliens. When Obama curtailed both programs in the face of massive protest, Trump, in an or Orwellian but powerful move, took those programs and made them his own. My plan also includes cooperating closely with local jurisdictions to remove criminal aliens immediately. We will restore the highly successful Secure Communities Program. Good program. We will expand and revitalize the popular 287G partnerships, which will help to identify hundreds of thousands of deportable aliens in local jails that we don't even know about. Both of these programs have been recklessly gutted by this administration, and those were programs that worked. This is yet one more area where we are headed in a totally opposite direction. There's no common sense, there's no brain power in our administration by our leader or our leaders. None, none, none. Those, again, were Obama's core immigration enforcement programs. Trump curtailed them under duress from a mass movement. Obama, Ob Obama curtailed them, sorry. And then Trump made them his own. This is the clearest example possible of Trump literally using Obama's programs as a right-wing nativist mobilizing tool. In conclusion, or close to conclusion, Trump wove all of the strains of nativism. Yeah, I have a few more slides, never mind. All the strains of nativism from fringe to the establishment into one potent right-wing message. He has inflicted massive pain and suffering on migrants and immigrants. But Trump also moved immigration politics so far to the right that the anti-immigrant anti politics finally snapped loose of its bipartisan moorings. This is a process, again, that had been underway since the Sensenbrenner bill and the mass protests against it in 2006. 
you can see right there the beginning of a divergence between Democratic and Republican public opinion toward immigrants that did not begin with Trump, but has accelerated sharply under him. Trump has recast an entire history of what was normal seeming anti-immigrant politics and border militarization as what it is, a monstrous effort to defend white supremacy that has guided this country since before its founding. And he did so from the moment he launched his campaign. This is a clip of Jorge Ramos interviewing Hillary Clinton in January 2016 at the Iowa Black and Brown Forum. So yet we do need to have secure borders. And what that will take is a combination of technology and physical barriers. But you want to roll them. No, we, we've already. You, you said that. Well, I voted for border security, and some of it was a fence. I don't think we ever called it a wall. Maybe in some places it was a wall. There you go. The so-called moderate politics of someone like Hillary Clinton, who voted for the Secure Fence Act, and who in 2003 said, quote, I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants, was suddenly and deservedly cast in a sinister light. This brings me to where we are now and where I think we should go from here. We must fight for immigrant rights without any pretense of compromising with the nativist right. Comprehensive immigration reform never stood a chance and it clearly does not now. Border militarization and deportations will not win the right over. Two different administrations tried that and all they did was inflict massive suffering on people. We can only secure immigrant rights if the left wins and the right is defeated. That's just the reality. I'm not saying that's gonna be easy, but it's what it is. The inverse is true as well. Immigrant rights is not a standalone issue. Immigrants are core members of a diverse American working class, something that organized labor knows very well. Ending oligarchic rule by the super rich, providing single payer health care for all as a human right, recharging the union movement, and fighting for a Green New Deal that will avert climate catastrophe and help make the global economy a just one can only be accomplished by mass movements that unite working class people rather than divide them. Fossil fuel funded campaigns to deny the, to, to deny the existence of global warming are no longer the greatest facilitator of fossil fuel destruction. Nationalism and xenophobia that divide people by race and by borders are. This is a moment of incredible danger, but also of historic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, <laughs> questions? Yes. Um, so I love what you've been saying to the that um, uh, historically both conservatives and liberals um, have contributed on this war on uh, immigrants. Uh, is there a part of the political spectrum that you would say has not participated in um, the war on immigrants? I mean, there have been like very principled social movements that protested um, along the way at every possible juncture. Um, so many groups, like particularly, uh, you know, like left-wing Chicano leaders like Bert Corona were you know, very appreciative about what was going on and the necessity. Like you have people like Bert Corona arguing, converting Cesar Chavez a get away from his anti-undocumented immigrant position and convincing Cesar Chavez who thought undocumented immigrants posed a threat to organized Mexican American farm workers that actually the working class in general and particularly the Mexican American working class had to be united. Um, and so at every moment, you have people who are entirely smart, reasonable, and humane and moral about it. Um, but in terms of the politics, I mean, you know, like there are people who voted no against all of these bills. Um, you know, Bernie Sanders voted no against all of these bills. Um, even more moderate liberals voted against all these bills. But the real kind of like neoliberal establishment oriented ones tended to vote yes. And the good, the good news, um, is, I mean, you saw that public opinion chart, which I just find fascinating, 
um, and encourage it. Like the conventional wisdom amongst like a certain type of uh, political scientist or commentator, no offense to political scientists in the room, um, you know, is that partisan polarization is this bad thing. Partisan polarization is very good on this issue because it was the very bipartisan basis of support for the war on immigrants that made it possible. And now it's a question of uh, either getting Democratic politicians on, on board with where their base is at or replacing them with someone else. Yeah. I can maybe follow up on that point because when you play the clip of Obama, it immediately sent back to me, sent me back to you know watching him give speeches like that, where it's always this sense that he's sort of like speaking to a sort of like angry uncle across the dinner table, you know, um, which then becomes imagined as the sort of American polity, right? It's like and so my question, I guess, is um, how do we speak to somebody else who's not that angry uncle, right? And how do we form a kind of public, I don't know, discourse? that isn't always sort of saying, oh, don't worry, we're going to do, doing all these things that you're worried about. You know, we're not doing all these things that you're worried about in relationship to immigrants. So do, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, yeah, like I, Obama, like, was, thought he was speaking to this, like, swing voting, right. white, middle, or working class American, when in fact he was also, like, very much conjuring them into existence yeah. um, through the way he spoke about them. And I feel like the Democrats are still doing that. They're still speaking to that person, and it's like, they need to figure out how not to do that. Yeah, well, like Ed Rendell and Chuck Schumer in 2016 said, oh, don't worry about Trump being an outrageous, like, sociopathic racist, because for every uh, working, for every working class voter we lose in central Pennsylvania, we'll pick up, you know, two swing voting women and, like, middle class women in the suburbs. And it didn't work, you know. Um, and so I think the way you talk about it is the way that unions who organize divert, like, ethnically and ideologically diverse people in their workplace talk about it, is you highlight common interests and then establish that as a way to move beyond mere instrumental common interests and create like true solidarity and common cause. Um, yes. Yeah. I think that's true across the board, and I was not like making some kind of like ultra left accelerationist argument before the election of like, we got to get Trump elected and then the mask will be off. But it's also true retrospectively, descriptively, and I'm not saying it was worth it or anything like that, but it's just descriptively, like you're saying, it is what happened. He did take the mask off. Um, and I think that's very true on immigration. Um, and um, just on sort of like, a, like the everyday everyday racism that was so like normal in in democratic neoliberal politics in particular. Um, that's why Joe Biden, you know, I mean, he's ha pulling higher than I would like, but but why he's having trouble is because stu all these things that that uh, that sounded like totally normal in the 1990s to way too many people suddenly appear as they always should have. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I'll have to think of other examples, but. My, my brain's just all immigration right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. I guess I have a question. I found it really compelling how you were talking about the ways in which Trump has weaponized some of the rhetoric from the Obama administration and programs and things like that. And I guess on the flip side of how communities are organizing and organized actors are pushing back, yeah. have you seen, even though it's like the same type of program, same type of criminalization and immigrant detention, um, have communities responded in different ways and similar ways um, in terms of the conflict of the program? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, th I think the one significant thing that, that happens I talk more about in in my book, and that you certainly know a lot about, is that um, is that there's this huge divide in the immigrant rights movement, like 
during Obama, where you have groups like NCLR, which is now U.S. Unidos or U.S. Unidos, um, and uh, the National Immigration Forum, and all those kind of groups, that are really doing everything to protect Obama. And it's people on the ground who are experiencing deportations in their communities that are like, "This is unacceptable," and introduce language like "deporter in chief" that uh, the head of NCLR ultimately picks up and brings to. O Obama, but even then, like they're still very much protecting him. Um, and I think, um, like my book is really more about the enemies of the immigrant rights movement than the immigrant rights movement itself, but of course that involves telling some stories about the immigrant rights movement. And I think maybe the way that, that Trump's election has shaped the immigrant rights movement in that sense is um, like that there's not as much middle ground that seems available to the big establishment organizations. But I have to say, after researching this book, I just don't have, I don't have a lot of confidence in these, these, these big establishment DC groups. Like uh, the, during Prop 187, the Prop 187 campaign in California, they were pulling the same kind of like, like just targeting the, the, the median voter um, thing that they were pushing through the Obama administration. They were, you know, trying to get uh, Latino students not to walk out of school in protest. They were trying to just have like, you know, suburb, like just like American flags everywhere. Um, and the same people were involved, like, you know, I don't know. And you still see like Cecilia Munoz who like beca became, uh, was an NCLR leader who became Obama's uh, domestic policy chief. She's on, she's on Twitter <coughs> every day defending Obama's deportation record. Um, so I think the political conditions for them to be powerful like are gone, but unfortunately some of those same people are still there. Um, and the foundation money, it's so important. Like Ford Foundation, I think the Open Society Institute, all these different foundations gave so much money to these big DC pro comprehensive immigration reform groups in groups like the National Day Labor Organizing Network, like the real left-wing militant grassroots local groups that have been resisting deportation since day one, they don't get that money. So that's a big problem. But that's always a problem for the left is like rich people don't want to give you money because you want to take away their money in a <laughs> systematic structural way. Um, Maybe one more question? Yeah. So I just have a question like, obviously, for somebody who doesn't really know law, like immigration law is like very complex and you know, all yeah. like the like acronyms and the numbers and stuff. So, but then when you like you're arguing, when you boil down to it, it's just like just like don't try to be modern again. So how would you like say like a good, a good <laughs> well, message? Like what's a good message to like make people understand that like the solution is like easier than like this bureaucratic like, process? Yeah, um, I mean I th I. Th I think again around the question of like how to how to speak to 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 people about this is uh, one to just know that like U.S. public opinion is probably the most pro-immigrant right now by far than it has ever been in the history of the United States. You would not know that from uh, looking at the White House right now, but there it is. So. Um, it's just a fact that we don't need to like tailor our message to, to people with xenophobic views. We have people who are already sympathetic to our arguments, and we can appeal to them by, by making arguments about like, about justice for immigrants and justice for immigrants as a component of, of, uh, of working class justice more generally. And I, you know, I, I don't. Um, it's been good to see. Uh, some of these taboos get broken in recent democratic debates. I don't, um, I don't love Julian Castro across the board, but I'm you know, very, very thankful that he made the decriminalization of unauthorized, of illegal entry into the country, made that a litmus test in the democratic primary. That's very important. That's a law that dates back to, I think, 1929 and was only really picked up in a serious way by uh, Bush and Obama and then Trump. And Trump used that to separate families. It's a perfect example of how Trump used an ordinary, normal policy to achieve like even more monstrous ends. 
Um, but now the debate on that's changing and it's become a litmus test to say no. Like, uh, and I don't, you know, the, the sky didn't fall. The, the like, uh, you know, stereotypical like middle American did not flee from the Democratic Party. Like we need to, um, we need to focus on, on the base that we have and energize it and then, you know, win over who we can um, through appeals to common interests, not to division. It just doesn't make sense.